dramatic finish to a World Cup match than this one. Africa, the birthplace of mankind. It also has the privilege of having its reins be blessed by these dudes, so you know it slaps. And when it comes to football, there is no exception. This continent has football in its blood and is blessed with abilities far beyond many give it credit for. Just ask Arsene Wenger. Or France. Like, the entire country. But in all seriousness, despite all of this, Africa has underperformed on the international stage pretty much since the dawn of time. An African club has never won the Club World Cup, and African teams have never had much luck in the World Cup either. Not even the one that was held on African soil back in 2010. You all remember the 2010 World Cup, right? Loud noises! However, in that World Cup, something almost miraculous happened. Ghana, the Black Stars, played a great few rounds and almost did the impossible. By the quarterfinals, every African nation had been eliminated and this team collectively had the hopes of an entire continent on their backs. And then, the incident happened. Luis Suarez became public enemy number one. Today, we're going to talk about it. The lead up, the main event, the aftermath, and why what happened was so significant. So significant that, 10 years later, the Ghana national team still refused to forgive him. So, with that being said, why is Luis Suarez not allowed back in Africa? Yo, what's up guys, really hope you're all doing well and staying safe. As I said in the intro, football in Africa is truly one of a kind. There are very, very few other places where you'll see the most unnecessarily elaborate skills being pulled out on a regular basis. Skills that in most cases are anything but progressive on the pitch. But at the same time, who cares? They're hype as hell. That's what I'm talking about! That's why he's the MVP! That's why he's the GOAT! And while we're on the topic of skills... Skillshare! <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I had to do it. Um, that's, that's right, Skillshare's back. I actually use it, so I'm pretty chuffed to have them back on the channel. Skillshare is an online learning platform used by millions of users both seeking and giving knowledge. There are thousands of courses on a huge variety of topics ranging from productivity, tips for starting side hustles, mindfulness, the works. I've actually been taking Ali Abdal's course on productivity and seeing as I regularly go through spats of laziness, I gotta say it's, it's pretty good. There has never been a better time than now to expand your skill set, and Skillshare are offering the first 1,000 people that joined using the link in the description their first month of their membership free. The best price. So why not get started adding more knowledge to your repertoire and join Skillshare today. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, let's get back into it. Despite the clear talent that lies on the continent, Africa is some paces behind Europe and South America in terms of quality and overall star power on the international stage. This is obviously not the case for all of Europe and all of South America, or literally every other region and nation in the world, but this video isn't about them. Egypt, Africa's most successful team ever with 7 AFCON titles, have only qualified for 3 World Cups since 1930. And further to that, they haven't won a single match in any of the World Cups they've played in. Cameroon, Africa's second most successful team with 5 AFCON titles, has had a bit more luck qualifying for 7 World Cups. And they even made it to the quarterfinals back in 1990, the furthest an African team has ever gone in the tournament's history. And by most accounts, this was a bit of a joyride for the Indomitable Lions. You ever seen this celebration before? You definitely have. That's Roger Miller. Here he is celebrating a goal against Colombia at Italia 90. He actually went on to score 4 goals in this World Cup. And this man truly deserves his flowers. To this day, he is the oldest goal scorer in World Cup history, hitting the back of the net at 42 years of age in the 1994 World Cup. In this clip that we just saw, he's 38. Something noteworthy is that before him, goal celebrations did get a bit raucous from time to time, but many view this celebration as the one that opened the floodgates for the more wacky and joyous celebrations we see in football. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that you can indirectly thank this man for the dab. Moving along, the heroics of the Cameroonian team from Italia 90 would go on to be repeated by Senegal 12 years later. The Senegalese did so by getting out of a group with a handful of historically successful teams. Denmark, who had won the 1992 Euros and were growing in football stature. Uruguay, who themselves were two-time world champions and 14-time Copa America champions at the time. <laughs> uh, more on them in a bit. And France, who were the reigning champions from the previous World Cup. Oof, this was not a good return for these boys. 
And funny story about France, every single player bar two on the Senegalese team were playing for French clubs at the time of this World Cup. I can, I can only imagine how the French felt about this at the time. However, just like Cameroon, Senegal fell victim to defeat in the quarterfinals. And so, the wait for African glory went on. Until 2010. But before we go into that World Cup, we gotta talk about this guy. Al Pistolero. Luis Suarez. By 2010, the man had been through his fair share of strange and controversial moments, but nothing outrageous. Just normal, run-of-the-mill stuff like forcing a move out of a club to move to a larger one, a spat of petulance on the field, arguing with referees, etc, etc. You know the deal. But nothing quite like what was about to happen. And nothing quite like what would happen in the years to come. Why has he done that? But before we get to any of that, following the 2009-10 season, Luis Suarez was on fire. Dude was coming off an insane season at Ajax where he scored 35 goals in 33 league appearances. At 23 years old, the guy was doing some crazy stuff, which brings us full circle to the 2010 World Cup. Suarez absolutely brought his form with him to South Africa when football's biggest competition came around. Alongside Diego Forlan, the two were causing all sorts of havoc from day one. With three goals and two assists from Suarez, and five goals and one assist from Forlan, over the course of this tournament, Uruguay were looking the real deal. And something to note is that, despite the fact that they were two-time world champions as I mentioned before, they hadn't made it past the round of 16 in 40 years by the time this edition came around. And this time, they did it with ease. An undefeated group stage run, a dramatic 2-1 win versus South Korea, and La Celeste were pretty much flying. And so, the quarterfinals were looming. And their opponents? Just like Cameroon and Senegal had done before them, the Black Stars had fought their way to the final eight of the World Cup. And ironically, just like Uruguay, they were living their own fairy tale. The 2010 edition was only their second World Cup outing in the country's history. It came off the back of the 2006 World Cup where they made it to the round of 16, a very impressive result for their World Cup debut. And the next time, they went one step further. Nigeria, Algeria, Cameroon, the Ivory Coast, and South Africa, the hosts, all failed to make it out of their groups. It was up to Ghana to carry the torch for Africa. And after a hard-fought group making it out on goal difference and a 2-1 win versus the USA, they were looking good. Asamoah Gyan was the star man with three goals up to that point and looked to be made of the right stuff. Ghana as a unit were in a good position. And the performances in this tournament were made all the more impressive thanks to the fact that they were missing arguably their best player in Michael Essien through injury. And their next goal was simple. Go where no other African team has ever gone before. The semi-finals. Which brings us to the incident. 2nd of July, 2010, Soccer City. Ghana vs Uruguay. Just like any game of knockout football, the stakes were high. So naturally, the approach from both sides was cautious. 45 minutes played, no goals. But just before half time, Suli Montari strikes, 1-0 Ghana. The joy only lasted for about 10 minutes of in-game time before Forlan drew level once more. The aerodynamics of that Jabulani ball was really something else, man. Who tested that? By the 90 minute mark, things were still unsettled, and going into the final minutes of the game, nothing had changed. However, in the 120th minute, just before penalties, Ghana got a free kick. The ball fell to Dominic Adia, and, well. Drama right at the end here, and the red card is shown. Suarez is sent off. A red card, a kerfuffle, and a penalty. A heinous act by Suarez, but all the same, Ghana still had a free spot kick in the 120th minute of the match. The game was still in their hands, until Gian sent his shot into orbit. Suarez and Uruguay were in elation. And I guess it was either the shock, the nerves, the exhaustion, or perhaps a combination of the three, but Ghana just did not have what it took to overcome Uruguay in the ensuing penalty shootout. For millions upon millions of people who were not even Ghanaian, Disappointment was an understatement. Luis Suarez has obviously been painted as the treacherous villain in this entire story, and rightly so. This is possibly the most cynical and blatant handball that I have ever seen in my entire life. It's definitely one of the most high profile. Mine is the real hand of God. I made the save of the tournament. Quotes like this did little to win him over in the public eye. To be fair, Neither did quotes like, sometimes in training, I play goalkeeper, so it was worth it. 
The guy is one of the biggest trolls in history, I swear. But at the same time, there is likely not a single person watching this video or that has criticized Suarez that would not be jumping on tables if one of their fellow countrymen did this. To his teammates, and indeed to his country, he was a hero. And in that context, he deserves to be. Whatever way you choose to view this, it was an act of self-sacrifice. And even further to that, justice was served right there and then. He got a red card and a penalty was awarded. When there is a handball in the penalty area, there is a red card and the player is thrown out of the game. Is Suarez also to blame for Ghana missing the penalty? The words of Uruguay coach at the time, Oscar Tabarez. He wasn't wrong. Asamo Gian, despite being one of the top performers in the tournament, simply crumbled under the pressure. In his own words, he didn't sleep for a week following this miss. You really do have to feel for him. But that's football. Eventually, while this was incredibly controversial when it happened, this whole event didn't count for much, as Uruguay were knocked out by the Netherlands in the semis. I can only imagine a certain West African country was pretty pleased by that result. In any case, Gian would go on to see better days and even earned a move over to England with Sunderland. And Suarez, well, Suarez had some really good times and some really, really bad times. In the end, all of this is just to say that I don't think Suarez will be going to Africa on vacation anytime soon. Certainly not Ghana. And there we have it. What's your fondest memory of the 2010 World Cup? Let me know in the comments below. That's all from me today. Hope you all enjoyed. Cheers, and I'll catch you in the next one.